Hey, Bankless Nation. Today we're doing a special video on the YouTube today because Hester Pierce... Hey, Bankless Nation. Today we are doing a special video on the YouTube because Hester Pierce, uh, warmly known as Crypto Mom, had this fantastic speech that first captured Ryan's attention and then captured mine. And so I think it's worthwhile reading it uh, because more people should hear about what a good regulator looks like and what they sound like when they are actually coherent about regulation and its original purpose, which is to align with the people that are being regulated, not just regulate them for regulation's sake. So without further ado, here is a speech titled Lawless in Austin from Commissioner SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, also a former podcast uh, guest. So if you want more of this, go tune into that episode. That was uh, about a week ago on October 8th. Thank you to the Texas Blockchain Summit for the chance to be here today. I have to start with my disclaimer that my views are my own and not those of the Security and Exchange Commission or my fellow commissioners. I am interested, however, in what my colleagues have to say, which is why Chair Gensler's habit, Gary Gensler's habit, of calling the cryptoverse the Wild West has captured my attention. He is not alone in referring to the crypto landscape as the Wild West, a place we imagine to be have been lawless, a society in which the gunslinger with the best reflexes and worst morals wins at everyone else's expense. Merriam-Webster defines the Wild West as the Western U.S. in its frontier period, characterized by roughness and lawlessness. Bringing government into that kind of environment to establish some order seems like a no-brainer. Today, however, I would offer a different take on the Wild West, and with that picture in mind, suggest a way forward in crypto regulation. The West of the... The West of the past called to people who are chafing against the staid and stale societies of the East and were looking to throw themselves into building a new future with a more promising place. The Western frontier was a place for the adventurous, the rough around the edges, the idealists, the free thinkers, and the restless. I am from Ohio, which is one of the, which was once the, what the West meant to people coming from the states on the eastern seaboard. Reflecting that history, the part of Ohio I am from is called the Western Reserve. My alma mater, not a military academy as some think, still carries the name of the region Case Western Reserve University. People from Connecticut settled the region in the early decades of the 19th century. These settlers left the relatively well-populated and well-ordered Connecticut and moved west with big dreams to a stunningly beautiful and bountiful part of the country but also one replete with dangers, disappointments, and difficulties. Western life was rough at first, as described in The Western Reserve, the story of the new Connecticut in Ohio. Quote, Conditions were wretched during the first quarter of a century, and no improvement was likely, likely to come without a transportation system and a supply of cash. Those things did come, and the enterprise and boundless energy, which brought Moses Cleveland and his men and his men to survey the wilderness and sustain the first settlers through the hard years in their clearings among the forests have never laggard or faltered. End quote. That spirit and energy became the basis for a thriving industrial, educational, and cultural hub in Ohio. I recently read a fascinating book by David McCullough, The Pioneers, which discusses the post-revolutionary war settlement of another part of Ohio, uh, Maratia, this time by the people of Massachusetts, he tells the story of the difficult journey west and the successes, disasters, dangers, and failures that shaped what eventually became a thriving community. To these immigrants, to, to these immigrants the west offered hope and promise in contrast to the east, as McCullough explains. Unprecedented financial panic had gripped the new nation since the end of the Revolutionary War. The resources and credit of the government were exhausted. Money in the form of scrip issued by the government was nearly worthless. Trade was at a standstill. Farmers were being imprisoned for debt, and it was the severe economic depression that followed the war would last even longer than the war. But out west now there was land to be had that has but out west now there was land to be had as never imagined. Vast land, rich land. West was the opportunity. West was the future. The settlers who moved west came only not only with high expectations, but with a whole range of talents and professions. They cultivated other skills by necessity after they had arrived. The society was rougher than the one they had left, but nevertheless, it was governed by the societal norms they had carried with them, by law, and by mutual concern heightened by the difficult conditions in the early years. 
Even if they had em emulated the old Eastern society in many ways, these new frontier societies were created by their inhabitants. McCullough describes, for example, the work by Marietta's leading citizens to ensure that Ohio was a free state and to develop educational institutions and make them accessible to the general population. It was not, of course, all good in the West. Ohio's very name, Iroquois for Great River, and the Native American names of many other places in Ohio serve as a reminder of the inhabitants who were forced out as immigrants from the East, from, from the east arrived. Ohio was the frontier in the early 19th century, but later in the century, people were still looking west, further west, for opportunity. John Soul wrote in the Indiana Express in 1851, Go west, young man. Horace Greenlee picked up this phrase 15 years later when he wrote, Washington is not a place to live in. The rents are high, the food is bad, the dust is disgusting, and the morals are deplorable. Go west, young man. Go west and grow up in the country. Texas may come to mind more readily than my native Ohio when we think of the Old West. Here too, though, the Wild West was marked by the order than more was marked by more order than the movies would have us believe. Andrew Morris, who, after a stint at Case Western Reserve University, moved west and eventually ended up in Texas, where he researched the Wild West and identified numerous forms of effective private regulation, which were effectively precisely because they faced competition which were effective precisely because they faced competition. Sorry, He explained, for example, that Texas cattlemen, whose ranches were delineated by clear property lines, were able to create order on their ranches. One ranch's code prohibited cowboys from gambling, carrying six-shooters, and keeping private horses, running game with ranch horses, drinking and stealing cattle from other ranches. As detailed in an article, quote, the, or titled, The Not-So-Wild Wild West, Western order was not limited to ranchers imposing gambling bans on their cowboys, but also included an array of private organizations dedicated to maintaining order. Uh, another quote. It appears in the absence of formal government that the Western frontier was not as wild as legend would have us believe. The market did provide protection and arbitration agencies that, functionally, that functioned very effectively, either as a complete replacement for formal government or as a supplement to that government. These ac accounts did not paint a picture of perfect order, but they suggest that social order, societal order, does not always come from the public sector. Morris explained that frontiers foster private order. The frontier is a difficult place. Conditions are harsh, social capital is spread thin, and many of these institutions we take for granted are missing or scarce. Morris then gives a shout out to a noted uh, economist and political philo philosopher, Frederick Hayek, noting that Hay Hayek oh gosh, Hayekin legal institutions flourished on the frontier and were lost as civ civilization advanced. This suggests that the current frontiers are likely to foster Hayekin legal institutions. History does not allow us to see how these private arrangements would evolve to meet new challenges over time. As For as Morris further notes, once there was wealth in the West, government's arrival was inevitable. Perhaps then it is inevitable on the crypto frontier too. Let us turn our attention there now. The crypto frontier, like the Wild West, appears pretty wild at first glance. Home to a lot of code slingers and speculators and some hucksters too, this new West also has its inter and intra protocol fights, friendships forged through shared difficulties and successes, colorful personalities, passions, dreams, hardships, spectacular failures, and remarkable victories. But as in the West of the past, there is order and discipline in all of that rough and tumble. Because crypto is built on code, the code itself serves as a governor of conduct. Built, but crypto is built on people too. And these people hold each other accountable not only through unbridled public discourse, but through using or not using a protocol. Protocol users, competitors, bug bounty hunters, and sophisticated skeptics monitor protocols for hints of centralization. Administrator keys vulnerable to compromise. Slow speed, high costs, lack security, and so forth. A system outage, rug pull, insider trading incident, or exposed flaw in the code gives rise to an inevitable firestorm. Decentralized communities collectively figure out how to deal with unanticipated problems. These cooperative and competitive discipline, disciplining mechanisms have helped clean up the crypto frontier, though there is more work to be done. The persistence of both self-regulation and calls by the crypto frontier for clarity from government regulators suggest that lawlessness is not the prevailing culture of the crypto frontier. On the other hand, ironically, our gunslinging ways in the old 
supposedly staid government regulatory world back east are causing people to question our commitment to the rule of law. Let me explain by raising several questions about our regulatory approach to date. I will conclude by suggesting that it is not too late for government regulators to set up clear rules that respect the unique attributes and the challenge of, challenges of life on the crypto frontier. One, is there really legal clarity around digital assets? A fundamental area of conflict between the SEC and the public is how much legal clarity there is around digital assets. The safe harbor I propose for token distribution events acknowledges there is uncertainty about when crypto asset offerings implicate security laws. But the prevailing attitude of the SEC is that there is clarity, so why bother with a safe harbor? The idea that there is clarity as to when crypto assets are securities must come as a surprise to lawyers advising crypto projects that have struggled with this issue for years. Take, for example, the public feedback we received relating to the commission, commission statement regarding the custody of digital asset securities by broker-dealers, which distinguishes between digital asset securities and non-security digital assets, which the latter of which we will not permit to be custodied by special purpose dealer brokers. In response, many commentators have asked for clarity on what constitutes a digital asset security. One second and asserted that it would be unfair to expect a broker-dealer to conduct the analysis given the lack of clarity. Moreover, if clarity means that essentially all tokens are deemed securities, then why even establish a commission position on a special broker purpose broker-dealers at all? Two, are we enforcing rules by setting, settling or settling for ambiguity? The SEC points to the Supreme Court precedent and our own growing list of enforcement actions and says the case is closed. Most digital assets are securities. Even if we were to accept enforcement as a proper way to provide clarity, it's not working. Definitive de uh, determinations of securityness have only occurred in a few instances in which a court, rather than the commission, has decided the matter. Even in those instances, a determination that a token was offered initially as a security does not say anything about the token itself being a security either at the time, in time of the initial sale or in the secondary transactions. Most of our crypto enforcement actions, however, have not litig been litigated actions. Rather, they have ended in settlements, which are not good vehicles for careful legal analysis. When a party settles an SEC enforcement action, it, is, it often is trying to get the case wrapped up so it can move on. It has no incentive to force the SEC, as a condition of the settlement, to lay out clear legal analysis. In cases when a platform is involved, the SEC generally states that, the o that only, only that some of the digital assets were securities without specifying which ones are or why. Commissioner Elad Roysum, sorry, Roysman, and I raised the issue in conjunction with a coin schedule settlement. Perhaps this approach is understandable since the parties to the settlement might not include the parties with the keenest interest in the security, non-security status of that token. Nevertheless, if the SEC cannot easily articulate, articulate what unassailable legal theory for why particular assets are securities, is the line as clear as the SEC maintains it is? The ambiguity ultimately serves us well because it effectively forces any actor with any connection to digital assets into our regulatory jurisdiction. Are we fighting for investors or fighting for jurisdiction? As stablecoins grow in popularity, they are drawing increasing in interest from an array of regulators jockeying for a regulatory position. Should stablecoin issuers be registered as banks? Should stablecoins be backed by deposit insurance? Should stablecoins be uh, designated as systemically important by the Financial Stability Oversight Council? Are stablecoins money market funds? Should the Consumer Financial Bureau, uh, Protection Bureau step in in protecting consumers? Given the stunning growth of stablecoins, Regulators, understandably, are asking whether they fit into an existing regulatory framework and what their consumer protection and long-term financial stability implications are. If they undertake this inquiry, however, I hope they will do so with an appreciation for the following. 1. Many people find stablecoins to be a convenient payment tool that facilitates the movement and exchange of cryptocurrencies. So any regulatory step that would curtail the use of stablecoins must be justified by a benefit that outweighs the loss convenience. Regulators, two, regulators sh should be careful with broad generalizations since stablecoins are not uniform in operation, peg, underlying reserves, or transparency. Three, overly broad application of the law to capture stablecoins inadvertently might capture other products and services. Four, 
attempts to dismiss stable coins by drawing on the experience of, uh, with 19th century private banknotes are, mis- are uh, based on a misunderstanding of both. And five, lastly, while trying to understand stablecoins is fine, stablecoin fear is unwarranted. As Federal Reserve Vice Chair Randall Quarles explained, we do not need to fear stablecoins. The Federal Reserve has traditionally support, uh, supported responsible private sector innovation. Consistent with this tradition, I believe we must take a strong account of the potential benefit of stablecoins, including a possibility that a U.S. dollar stablecoin might support the role of the dollar in the global economy. New section, section number four. Are we protecting investors or denying investors opportunity? Embedded with this negative Wild West analogy for the crypto frontier is the concern that the unwitting and unwilling investors are being harmed by partaking in the crypto markets. Those who do not view the opportunity to participate in these markets as valuable, the lack of regulatory clarity in the United States could actually be a way of better protecting investors from harm. If ambiguity prevents them from participating, so much the better. From this perspective, that some projects and platforms, for example, including, uh, exclu- for example, exclude Americans because of regulatory uncertainty is actually a good thing. It is, it is the, o- the projects that fail to keep out Americans that face enforcement actions. Widespread geoblocking of Americans should concern American regulators, even if it does lighten their regulatory load. Consider, for example, recent well-publicized examples of airdrops that excluded Americans. An airdrop is essentially a free allocation of tokens to, for example, participants in a network. These tokens are ways of rewarding network participants. Why would we want U.S. uh, participants to be excluded from receiving the reward due to them? Take a look at Twitter after one of these airdrops. The SEC is not being thanked. (laughs) Commissioner Pierce is on Twitter. Whether by slow walking product approvals or directly disapproving products by uh, using creatively applied standards, regulators can make certain products avail certain products unavailable to investors. The commission's approach to pooled crypto investment vehicles illustrates this problem. The current available uh, product offerings include over the counter products and mutual funds with limited exposure to crypto futures, ETFs with exposure to the crypto industry and public companies holding crypto on their balance sheet are less direct less convenient, and more expensive for investors than the spot crypto-based exchange-traded product offered in other countries. From the perspective of a, of a regulator who does not really like the product anyway, nothing is lost. The investor, however, loses an opportunity to participate that is worth something to her, even if she chooses not to buy that particular product. Just having the option of doing so is valuable. As C.S. Lewis noted, of all tyrannies, a, t- a tyranny sincerely exercised for the good of his victims may be the most impressive. This kind, of, this very kindness stings with in- an intolerable insult. Five, are we going to pretend everything is centralized so we can regulate it? Chair Gensler has pointed out correctly that labeling something decentralized does not necessarily make it so. We saw this phenomenon at play in a recent purported DeFi enforcement action which charged a company and two top two executives that ran an illegal offering. And maybe it was at play to a lesser degree in a case from several years ago against the the creator of a decentralized trading venue that has some centralized features. But what happens when we are dealing with a protocol that facilitates peer-to-peer or or person-to-code transactions without a centralized intermediary? Is there anyone who could be held liable in a manner consistent with the rule of law of our constitutional principles? Can we hold responsible the developer of an open source protocol for how others use it or what other, others build on top of it? Perhaps we should not get even perhaps we should not even get to these questions. After all, if people avail themselves of an automated market maker to exchange crypto, have they not done so with an appreciation that it is the code that determines how the trade will happen? and that nobody stands ready to reverse a bad trade. Truly decentralized platforms do not mesh well with a regulated approach designed for centralized finance. As one commentator observed, so every time they say the platform must do this, the platform must do that, what does it mean? Implicitly, the only way of understanding these comments is an interpretation of security market regulations as being about what kind of software is allowed to be written. This won't fly. As it turns out, lots of people want to deal with centralized intermediaries in the crypto space. 
We can regulate those entities if they engage in securities activities, assuming, of course, we can make it possible for them to actually do business with it in our regulatory framework. But DeFi protocols with which people choose to interact ought to be viewed through a different lens. Treating DeFi differently would, in the words of attorney uh, Collins Belton, make the SEC probably the best motivator of making something truly decentralized. And that would not be a bad thing for crypto, which, after all, prides itself on decentralization. 6. Are we catching bad actors or creating a catch-22? The good actors want to know which digital assets are security so they can figure out how to comply with securities laws. But we have done little during my nearly four years on the commission to explain what that would look like. I lay, I lay the blame on myself and my colleagues on the commission. We simply have not allowed the latitude to consider the hard questions around how crypto can operate within the securities framework. The way forward is to not drag entities into the commission through enforcement actions and brute force them into a regulatory regime that is not actually well suited for them. Rather, we should take a metho uh, methodological, metho methodol oh God, methodol God, methodological, oh God, Jesus, I'm sorry, approach one that provides answers to the key questions to which market participants need answers. In a dissent in an enforcement action against crypto trading uh, platform Poloniex, I laid out a paradox. Deeming digital assets to be securities means the platforms that trade them and entities that intermediate them have to register with us. But they cannot operate as a registered entity under our existing rules, so they would not be able to register. In that dissent, I called for answers to a number of questions, which I think bear repeating here because they give a sense of complexity that arises at least once at least one digital asset trading uh, on a platform is deemed to be a security. Can the platform custody client assets, a feature, typically, uh, feature typical of centralized crypto trading platforms? If so, how, given our concerns about how, given our concerns about custody of digital asset securities? Two, if not, could a sufficient number of broker dealers navigate the registration process to make a liquid market? Three, would the conditions placed on their registration permit them to function as a market maker or to facilitate trading on behalf of retail investors? Four. Can the platform trade non-securities along alongside securities? If not, how can the platform using two entities, a broker-dealer entity for digital asset securities and affiliated non-broker-dealer entity for non-securities, offer a seamless or at least serviceable trading platform to customers who are likely, for example, to want to trade both digital assets and digital asset security securities and pay for transactions in digital asset securities using non-digital non-security digital assets? How can trading five? How can trading platform? How can a trading platform and its customers determine whether a particular digital asset is a security? Six. If a token was sold in a securities offering as part as a, of an investment contract, how long must secondary transactions in that token uh, be deemed to be securities transactions by the platforms trading the tokens? Seven. Lastly, what are the mechanics of registering tokens sold as part of an investment contract as a class of equity security under the Exchange Act? And there are others that I did not mention in that dissent. For example, how can a broker dealer or trading venue work with digital asset securities alongside non-digital asset securities and non-digital securities? How does Security Investor Protection Act coverage work when a broker dealer engages in digital assets? What is the appropriate role, if any, of a transfer agent with respect to a digital asset securities? Who can custody digital assets consistent with securities laws? Should the Financial Accounting Standards Board address crypto accounting issues? How does a platform that finds itself trading securities due to the new definitional clarity around digital asset securities, assuming that that clarity comes at some point, find itself trading digital asset securities come into compliance? If we intend to demand registration of entities in the crypto space, we have to give our staff the permission to do the hard work of figuring out how the rules will apply given the unique aspects of the business and to seek broad public input through a transparency, regulatory, not enforcement process in doing so. Conclusion. These questions are intended to spur a deeper cross-government commitment to searching for sensible regulatory solutions. The stakes are high because the government is riding into crypto town with a promise that it can do a better job than the existing informal disciplinary mechanisms. We do have regulatory experience that we can bring here to bear but we have to do so carefully. As government agencies consider how to regulate, they ought to take their lead from Congress, work in collaborative with one another, and actively consult the public who will be subject to and protected by these rules. 
I might approach this whole endeavor with a less strict hand than some of my fellow regulators. But the real question is not what I or any other regulatory wants, but, it, it, but what the people, the intended beneficiaries of this regulation want. I am eager to see who, I'm eager to see what you accomplish on the crypto frontier once we set some sensible, clear regulatory parameters. To paraphrase the standard closing words of a popular crypto podcast, which follow an appropriate warning about the riskiness of the space. We are headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone. Thank you for allowing me to drop in on your journey west. Technically not how we finished the podcast, but close enough. Hester Peirce, this is such a valid, great, con the speech itself is a great uh, contribution towards the discourse. And hopefully me reading it aloud, putting it on the YouTube allows this to be spread even more because this is what aligned regulation looks like. This is what, the, the line here at the very end, well, where is it? Here it is. I might approach this whole endeavor with a less strict hand than some of my fegular, fegular, re, uh, fellow regulators, but the real question is not what I or any other regulator wants. It's regulation is not about the regulators. And she says it, she follows up with, but what you, the people, the intended beneficiaries of this regulation want. And so Hester Pierce has extreme amount of clarity with what the purpose of regulation is. Stop restricting U.S. citizens from getting airdrops. You're just stopping them from getting $60,000. Stop doing that. You're not benefiting the people. You're supposed to make the people's lives better, not worse. That is the point of government. And Hester Peirce is very, very aware that this is not the what the SEC has done recently. So Hester, thank you for the speech um, and continue fighting that good fight. Thank you so much.